So a warm welcome. So a warm welcome to the first of the series of four technical talk webinars uh, featuring Ralph Goldney of Rail Freight Consulting, who will be joined by guest presenters from the rail industry. So whether you're an expert yourself and are looking, uh, joining us to refresh on the technical knowledge, or perhaps like me, someone who is keen on a bit of professional development, I'm sure you'll get plenty out of what we have for you in the coming weeks. So if you're on to another event, such as the Rolling Stock Forum that by organised by Waterfront this morning, uh, we won't keep you beyond 9.30. And if you're already there, we hope Waterfront gave you a good breakfast. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A as they occur to you. And we'll try and get in as many as possible. Um, also, just a reminder that this is being recorded and will be on YouTube later uh, so that you can get the slides uh, by emailing uh, Yvonne. Uh, if you wish to have a copy of the slides. So today we're going to be looking at wagon design, construction and future advancements. So it's my pleasure to hand you over to our host, Ralph Goldney, uh, as I said earlier, MD of Rail Freight Consulting, who will start us off uh, and as he goes through the presentation, introduce today's guests. So over to you, Ralph. Uh, thanks, Phil. Um, Yvonne, sh should we leave it a second? Is, is is everybody in the house or should we just leave it for a couple of minutes for, for people to arrive? We've got 47 joined I, so far. Yeah, I think you should just start. Just start. Okay, folks. All right. So I'll share my screen. Um, and hopefully you're going to see. Yeah, there it is. I hope everybody can see that. that that's... Uh, that's what we're talking about today. These are these are wagons, and this is a really old wagon. This is a, a metropolitan milk wagon, uh, for, which was used in the uh, on the Great Western. Um, and this is what we're talking about. What a lovely, lovely vehicle this is. Uh, you can see the louvers to keep the milk cool. Uh, you can see on here three tons of milk. That, that's quite a thing, particularly if there's a few of those in the train. That'd be quite something to see. This this lovely uh, this lovely uh, vehicle is actually in the London Underground Museum at Acton. They, they've got it's not the London Transport Museum, but London Underground Museum. Well, I don't know, maybe it's London Transport. Anyway, it's at Acton, and uh, they have open days, and they've got lots of interesting stuff like this. So this is this is really nice to see. Anyway, I'm going to just um, give a couple of slides to introduce the subject. Uh, and then Mitch is going to give us uh, four or five slides around the technical aspects. Les is going to talk about wagon construction and building. I'm going to finish off with a couple of slides looking at the future, and then we've got some time, hopefully, for questions and answers. Um, please, any comments, put it in the chat. And uh, as, as Phil says, any questions, we'll, we'll take at the end. So we're, we're up and running talking about wagons. Let's hope this all works. So, so here we are. Here we are. Cement wagon at Tunstead, a um, uh, very unusual wagon in that it's, it's, the, the cement is blown in. And I'd just like to make sure we're on a common level of understanding here about what we're talking about. So, so this is a wagon that we're talking about. We're really talking about modern wagons here. So by modern wagons, I mean four wheels on the wagon, uh, two wheels put together in what we call a bogey. So from the bottom up, we have what we call a bogey. So the bogey is this steel frame which holds the axles, should have put two S's in there, uh, axles, the suspension, you can see there's some, there's, there's a primary suspension which is here and there's a, there's a separate uh, secondary suspension, uh, and then the brakes. It's a really, really important part of the wagon, there's a huge amount of value added uh, in the wagon build about this, I know Les will talk about this, and in the future we're going to do a, a session just looking at these things because it's a really interesting thing about how they transfer, transfer the forces into the track. Then we have the rest of the underframe. So all wagons more or less have a structural member running from one end to the other called the sole bar. And basically you can think about a beam <coughs> supported in two places to take the weight, weight down. At the end, we have the buffers. And when you think about it, they're designed to take <coughs> compressive force. When the train comes together, when it's bra braking, it, it transfers that force. The train gets slightly shorter when it brakes. And then we've got a screw coupler that you can't really see, but actually there's, there's basically a hook and an eye that it takes attention. It actually drags the train along. The brake equipment, there's air reservoirs and all kinds of stuff underneath here. Uh, and you can see there's a, there's a handbrake wheel here. So that's on the underframe. And actually a lot of this is common on a lot of other vehicles. And then the top, uh, we have what I'm going to call a containment. Um, and this is where wagons do vary. Uh, and it's holding the product. 
The four major types are, are tanks, box, hoppers, and intermodal. Uh, and so let's just have a look at those. So this says that all wagons are the same, but different. Uh -huh. So at the top here, we've got boxes, tanks, and hoppers. So this is, uh, this is Crossrail, this is a JNA wagon. You will hear me talk about wagons by, the, by three letter acronym, which is what we commonly talk about. JNA, TEA, HYA, or probably an HHA. So the first letter designates the type of wagon. T is tank, H is hopper, F is flat, and for some crazy reason, J is box. I don't really understand that, but hey. The A at the end stands for air brake, uh, and the letter in the middle, the three letter in the middle, is sort of a sequential uh, uh, number for each type. So we've got a box wagon here uh, for carrying spoil, in this case, or, or aggregate. This is a, a tank wagon, British Airways, taking uh, jet fuel to Heathrow. Um, this is a, a coal wagon. Um, um, now, a hopper wagon is loaded from the top and discharged at the bottom. And uh, this wagon isn't painted, and you can see a seam there with a weld. And, and actually, these hopper wagons are, are like bathtubs in that you've got a sloping side at the end, uh, and they're designed so that the, the material flows out between the axles, and that enables them to be discharged very, very quickly. So we've got a coal hopper here, we've got an aggregate hopper here. This has got uh, some kind of back to the future type doors on the top. And this is the first generation of biomass wagons. And, and actually uh, this was done at Davis's in, in Chidebrook. Uh, and we put these aluminium doors on the top to keep the product, stop, product from blowing out. Biomass is very light. Um, so the maths here, and this is real fundamental stuff, is that the gross laden weight is the sum of what can be carried on the four axles. And in the UK, in most places, uh, we've got a 25.4 tonne axle weight. And it's really Wales, parts of West Wales, where we don't struggle with that. But, but simplistically, axle weight, 25.4 tonne, gross laden weight, 101.2. The payload of the vehicle, what it can carry, is just simply the, the gross laden weight, the maximum gross laden weight of the vehicle, taking away the self weight known as the tear of the vehicle. And that, that varies. For an intermodal wagon, well, we'll show you one of those in a second, there's nothing to them and they're very light. Uh, whereas some of these tank wagons can get up to sort of 25, 26 tonnes. So generally the payload is around 75 tonnes. So if you've got a 20 wagon train, we, we talk about generally it being equivalent to 75 HGVs if an HGV is carrying a 20 tonne payload. And, and that's the simple maths behind this. Now, actually, a lot of freight trains are, are longer than 20 wagons, some are shorter, uh, but you can see how the maths and, and, and the equivalence between uh, road and rail works. The other thing that I'd like to just, just draw these photographs is um, to say that wagons are very commodity specific. So what I mean by that is that um, they're designed to carry a particular commodity. So this is an HYA wagon, as I said before, carrying coal. And coal has a, um, a density of about 0 0.7, 0 0.72, so 720 kilograms per, per cube. So this vehicle has a 90 cube hopper and is just less than 90 meters long. This vehicle here is an aggregate hopper. This is a pearly. Uh, um, and it has a 56 cube hopper because aggregate weighs about 1.3. And so actually the wagon is about, this wagon here is about 15 meters long. And that reduction of four meters in wagon length means that on an aggregate train, you can run more vehicles for the same train length. And in many terminals, they're length constrained. And this is why we, we have, we optimize our wagon length. And indeed this, this wagon on the left-hand side of the HYA was GBRF's entrance into the coal market and was slightly shorter than the competitor wagons, uh, which gave GBRF a, a big advantage when, when these wagons mm. came in that they could carry 5% more payload per train. So there's a lot of work goes on in optimizing wagons. There's, there's, there's a lot more to it. Then we have uh, intermodal wagons. Uh, so this is at Hams Hall. This is, this is the latest, uh, most up-to-date intermodal wagon. It's uh, an eco freight, which is a triple wagon permanently well semi-permanently coupled between three platforms so there's no buffers in between these vehicles there's buffers at the end but not in between the wagons to shorten the wagon to make it as short as possible and it's designed to carry 40 foot platforms so that's an intermodal wagon wagon and as i say there's no weight in them um 
Then this is a whopping great wagon from, from UAE. This is carrying sulfur. And over here, they can ha they have a 30 ton uh, axle limit. So this, this vehicle here is designed to carry 90 tons of sulfur. So the point is really that, that, that not all wagons have the same axle weight. Now in the UK, intermodal wagons run with a 20 ton axle weight. They run faster, 75 miles an hour, so they have a lower self weight and actually containers are slightly lighter. Here in this example, um, it's a 30 ton axle weight limit. And actually, there are various axle weights in different parts of the world. Across Europe, generally, we're, we're 22 and a half ton axle weight limits. And so in Europe, we talk about 90 ton vehicles. So what's interesting about this is that generally, Europe is different to us. So we can't generally bring European wagons across to the UK for two reasons. They have reduced axle weight, so they're not as um, spatially efficient and also have a slightly larger gauge, uh, so they're physically bigger. Uh, the exception to that is intermodal wagons, where they don't tend to overrun in the same way. And because we have a slower axle weight limit here, they can run. So you'll, you'll get some mega frets that come over. So that's a very, very quick blast through wagons, the fundamentals. And now I'm going to pa pass on to Mitch to talk about some technical aspects. Over to you, Mitch. Okay, Ralph, um, I just wonder, uh, as you change over, whether you are able to um, make this into the slideshow format, because at the moment it's sort of displaying the thing with the next slide and the notes. I don't know if you can make that any larger on the screen. I think it's one of the things at the bottom. I'm sorry about that. No uh, problem. Uh, uh, I'm sure I can, but whether I can is a different matter. Has that worked? Um, has that worked? Mm. No, Ralph, I think right. if you just stop the share and reshare it, you've come in in a different format somehow. So put it onto slideshow before you share it on your computer and reshare it in slideshow format. Okay, I'm sorry about that, folks. No, that's right. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, we've, we've been no. here before. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, I'm very glad that you've told me. That. Hang on. Just makes it a little bit bigger for people, that's all. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um. I'm sorry, the issue is that uh, that actually I then can't share. Um, so I'm sorry about this, folks. It's very annoying. I'm going to try and do it um, a different way. Um, yeah, now go into slideshow from there. Yeah, how's that? Yeah, that's the one. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Sorry about that. So, Mitch, over to you, mate. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm just going to put a little bit of meat on the bones uh, from what Ralph has just explained to you. So I'm going to talk about Wang design, still at a fairly high level, uh, but this is primarily for the delivery of train load goods in the UK for profit. As Ralph has alluded to, there's various commodities and all the ones that he's mentioned so far really are things like coal, petrochemical, containers, we're not talking at the moment about things for use for uh, maintenance of the track, delivering sleepers, rail, and uh, cleaning up afterwards, things like that. It's really for uh, commercial delivery of product. And the UK market is a little different to that in Europe, our nearest neighbours, in that our railway is quite old. It has various restrictions on it not least the size of the gauge, but um, other restrictions as well. So our market for rail is a little bit different to our European neighbours. We tend to be very uh, focused on efficiency. The wagon must be the best it can be for the job that it's got to do. Um, however, we do have higher axle loads, uh, so therefore we can take advantage of that. And we don't tend to use off-the-shelf products. Uh, we tend to uh, make the wagon very specific, as I've just said, whereas in Europe they can more or less go to a shop and uh, purchase the wagon that they desire. So essentially our wagon designs are driven by the end user's requirements, so the user or the owner, what they want from the wagon is feeding into the the final design parameters, but also the approval 
requirements. So the, the route acceptance side of things, uh, uh, route access requirements, things like that. So those two things strongly feed into coming up with the design parameters for any particular given wagon. And those things will give you your commodity, it's coal containers, petrochemical, and how those things are loaded and unloaded. So that has a big impact on the design. For example, a tank wagon might be required to interface with existing infrastructure where the loading from overhead is at already established specific points and the unloading points from underneath are again at specific points and that gives you effectively your wagon length. Uh, your total train length can be very important as well. Uh, it might be that you've got to fit inside certain restrictions at the site of delivery or en route. And really you want to maximize the amount of product that you can deliver given that train length. And that impacts on the volume that you're carrying and your tear and laden mass. So a, a dense product would uh, typically you'd be aiming to uh, have a higher axle load with a dense product to maximize your uh, delivery potential. So something like stone would be typically in a 100 ton or 102 ton wagon. Um, gauging strategy is very important. Typically in the UK, and I'll come on to that in more detail, we're looking at the W6A gauge. So this is the structure gauge. Uh, but if you're carrying containers, there is options to use other gauges. The strength of the wagon, this has a big impact. So you've got choices of materials. Typically, almost everything that we do is mild steel in the UK, but there are exceptions. Uh, coal wagons, for example, with the corrosive nature of coal and the need to ensure free exit of the coal from the wagon we tend to use a, a semi stainless steel 3cr12 and there is options then as well to go for lighter tear weights using aluminium but this is these are fairly uncommon mostly it's mild steel it's a good material for wagons it's strong it's ductile which means it can withstand a little bit of misuse, a bit of abuse, so it, it's quite forgiving in that respect. It's very well understood. We understand how it behaves. We understand its limitations and we understand how to form it and join it together and make the shapes that we need. Another consideration is operating speed, and this is tied in with axle load. Um, the operating speed in this country has a cutoff at about 20 0.5 tons and we'll see that again in a minute so lighter products less dense products can run faster than heavier products or it's a limit that you have to make a decision about that leads on to running gear we don't have any or well, none that i know new two axle wagons we pretty much default to bogey wagons now and there are some limited choices on those bogies uh, Y25 is uh, has been very typical bogey. That's a European bogey, but it's axle load limited. And equivalent to that is the uh, BR developed FBT6, which was a strengthened Y25 for 25 ton axle load. Three piece American style bogies. They're they've been in and out of fashion. Um, they they're not so track friendly as others. And there's the SCT bogies, the TF25 bogey, and the LTF25 bogey, its predecessor. So there are some established choices of running gear out there. And it's uh, a relatively uh, simple or limited choice. So uh, it's a relatively simple choice. Braking performance, not much to say about that. Obviously, the wagon has got to be stopped. Modern brakes are quite well established. And essentially, it's a choice between tread brake and uh, disc brakes, but disc brakes are expensive. However, they are better for higher speeds. Uh, payload restraint, that means how the payload is held on the wagon. And for the wagons that we can see on here, it's a fairly given thing. Uh, the hopper at the top, the product is contained inside, box wagons the same. Tank wagon, obviously that's uh, completely sealed. The object of the exercise of the tank wagon is to make sure it's full because if it's not full, slushing is a problem. Uh, so it's, they are 
bespoke the volume and the density are well matched to ensure there's no sloshing that that's in terms of restraining the liquid inside and then below at the bottom you can see container carrying wagons there the containers are sat on either twist slots or uic spigots or equivalent so that can affect the design of your wagon then we move to how the wagons are connected to each other into vehicle connections. Ralph mentioned buffers and screw couplings. That's the most common uh, and most prevalent. However, there are options. You can have intermediate draw bars, which are semi-permanent. You can have uh, things like um, buckeyes and tight lock couplers, which are more uh, from our American market but they're stronger and relatively easy to use in that there's not so much human interaction required and there's the potential for the forthcoming DAC a digital autocoupler that may be coming out of Europe okay next please yeah, I'm just, which I'm just going to say that this is a this smoke wagon has an aluminium body to save about two ton of tear weight uh, to carry more product so this is the sort of uh, development that we're going on so that those requirements, restrictions feed into uh, the wagon design, but this is almost the first place I would go to in terms of wagon design. This gives a very big picture and enables the initial sizing to take place. And the two yellow strips that I've highlighted, they'll pick up on the two points I've mentioned. The axle load limit changeover is at 20.5 tonnes axle load. So if you look across that line there to the right hand side, you can see maximum speed in miles an hour. It's 75 miles an hour all the way down to and including 20.5 tonnes. After that, any, any axle load above that, we are restricted to 60 miles an hour. And that's due to so, track force, isn't it, Mitch? That's due to the load that goes into the road, is it? A dynamic I've, I've got to say, I, I assume so, but uh, track damage is principally driven by unsprung mass. I'm not 100% sure why we have this changeover at this axle load, but it's been mm. with us for so long. And there's never really been a real attempt to challenge it, I don't think. If anybody knows better than that, I'd be interested to yeah. hear from you. Please put but, something in the chat if, if we get anything wrong, please. Yes. Yeah, we yes. But that, that changeover, that 75 mile an hour to 60 mile an hour changeover, has been with us for a very long time. It seems to be, well, Maybe not written in stone, but it's certainly very well established. And there are another couple of things that you can pick out from this uh, in terms of choice, choice of bogey. So you can see if you look in the, the, the column that's titled minimum wheelbase, that's the bogey wheelbase. You can see it's six foot, again, up to and including 20.5 tonnes. Uh, but after actually 22.5 tonnes, after that, you are forced to have a two meter wheelbase bogey. There's a, a number of other things that this will do for you, for overall length, overhang, so how far the buffers are in front of the, the nearest wheel and other essential dimensions. If you comply with this and remain within the maximum minimum limits, you essentially get a typical route availability. So for the heavier axles, you, you would be able to get 25.5 uh, ton axle load, you could get RA10 if you comply with this, and, and obviously smaller RA numbers down the list. That's it, this okay. one. The really big thing that influences the size of our wagons is the gauge. I mentioned earlier on that we have a smaller railway than our European neighbours. Our railway is perhaps the, one of the oldest, if not the oldest. And when it was built and the tunnels were being made and so on, it was obviously expensive and time consuming to build a large tunnel. So our tunnels are not so large. Uh, the, in Europe, they have the burn gauge, which is somewhat bigger than this. And as Ralph intimated earlier on, the, it's difficult to bring European wagons into our country because of their size um, we have we have essentially smaller wagons because of the limitations of our infrastructure there are essentially four ways 
to determine the size of a wagon and you see them listed there so standard vehicle gauges that's what most of us would be familiar with the w6a gauge and so on then absolute gauging that is the most expensive option where the vehicle characteristics are thoroughly understood and comparisons are made with the route that you want to run over and this is typically applied to passenger vehicles where they're really trying to maximize the size they know exactly where they're going to run and they've got more money to invest in that aspect of the design then the other two comparative gauging and hybrid gauging these uh, essentially are versions of the previous two uh, different ways of bringing those two things together to try and keep the cost down what you can see in the diagram is essentially the W6A gauge, which I hope is a phrase that's familiar to most people. In the new standards in the document 8073, those two are separated now. And the way that, that uh, the standard vehicle gauges are delivered to the user is that there's an upper gauge and a lower gauge. The difference being that the lower gauge is dynamic, so it's dependent on suspension movements whereas the upper gauge is, is not dependent on suspension movements, is principally dependent on curve overthrow. Both of them are important. Both of them depend on curve overthrow, but the, the bottom one has suspension movements in it as well. And this, this type of gauge would be directly applied to something like a box wagon or a tank wagon or a hopper wagon but there are some nuances and some more options available if you're looking to carry containers. So for container carrying wagons, there's a, a suite of ever bigger gauges, W7, W7A, 8, 8A, 9, 9A, uh, all the way up to 10A. And essentially those give us an increase, usually in the top left and top right hand corners to have a higher uh, containers and this is from basically established traffic have, has given us these additional spaces but over restricted routes so it's not uh, these w7 through to w10 are not go anywhere gauges um, and sometimes you get a little bit of extra space in the bottom left hand corner as well uh, ralph you can just yes yeah, just down there you get a, a little bit of extra space for the structure of the wagon down there which has been lowered to accommodate the uh, deck height. Now, how am I doing for time? You're okay, Mitch, you're okay. Okay, yep, yeah. okay. Yeah. To, so from here, I'm gonna talk about uh, future developments. So go to the okay. next slide. Uh, and just to say, obviously, um, this one of the issues with the UK gauge is that, that Victorian arches don't sit well with containers. And, and that's a big issue, which is what Mitch has alluded to. Okay, Mitch. Okay, so what? I want to talk about here is um, recent advances that to have pushed the envelope of the restrictions that I've just been talking about. And one that we've mentioned a couple of times now, this is the aluminium tank wagon. So there's it's that payoff between payload and tear weight. So if the if the vehicle didn't weigh anything at all, then you could invest all of your time and effort in carrying much more payload mass, the thing that is paying the money at the end of the day. Uh, so reducing the tear weight of the vehicle will allow the transport of higher density product, more higher density product. So here this cement tank is made of aluminium and juice tear weight, and therefore you can get another couple of tons of product in there. So multiply that by the number of wagons in the train, multiply that by the number of trains per day, per year. And there is a payback for the investment in the extra design effort to do this in aluminium rather than the more traditional and more comfortable steel. Uh, other improvements have been in looking at train length versus volume. So the bottom right hand side there, that's the biomass wagon. As you can see, it's Drax's biomass wagon. And the, the product is not very dense. So in in the given length that you've got the more product you can get in each wagon the better 
and there was a restriction of something like 500 meters 491 meters i think was the desired training length for the infrastructure at uh, drax and the idea was to get as much biomass in that length as possible so the the game changer here was to actually introduce hoppers to the outs outboard of the bogey so if ralph can point just underneath there so normally to that right hand side of the bogey and the left hand side of the bogey the ends of the vehicle that space is lost uh, it's uh, in that in the wagon above that space is lost so underneath that black cover there is essentially brake equipment and a, mm. quite a void um, whereas in the in the drax biomass wagon that is now full of biomass and the only void you can see is that's just there yes that's the only void and that's where the brake equipment is shoehorned into there immediately above the bogey and, and you can kind there. of see the angle of dangle on the biomass there can yeah. you, can't you so so here's the here's the bathtub on the coal on the seam and you can see effectively what we did was we we brought that back and used this space at the end so that gained uh, additional volume in a given length and and in all honesty, it wasn't a new idea. It was tried by Powell Dufferin, I think, on an aluminium wagon uh, in the in the nineties, I believe. But the it's the aluminium aspect of it that was the problem. This was done in steel in three CR twelve, and it's uh, it's been a success. Um, other the things that have allowed us to make some of these step changes is the use of modern computer aided equipment design equipment so computer aided design itself means that we can be very specific about the shape and size of the wagon and really maximize whatever it is that we're trying to do whether it's deck height or volume uh, finite element analysis has been a real bonus uh, this it's in many many ways it's allowed us to really finesse the designs but it's also allowed us to reduce the need or eliminate the need for testing in terms of strength. Um, just on that subject, there is a, a slightly different approach to strength in Europe. In, in they use 12663 part two, and they essentially choose to test their wagons and can do a lot less FEA, but have the additional cost of doing the testing. And, uh, and we should uh, crack on a bit, mate, if that's okay. Okay, that's it. Well, we're nearly there anyway. And I was just going to say that there's a new standard for strength coming out, which uh, will be a bittersweet experience. It will possibly allow more finesse and reductions in weight, but there, there's an additional expense of the, there's more effort into proving the wagon strength using that standard. Okay. Uh, but it could allow reductions in weight given the balancing effort put into it. And you're on one or two of these uh, EN committees, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mitch. That's really good. Um, and I see some questions coming in, so that's great. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to Les, who's uh, going to talk to us about um, wagons. So over to you, Les. I think that the, the first slide, all being well, is a bit of a... Over to yep. you. Yep. It's only, it's only a quick one. So morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Les Bryant. I'm the Group Engineer and Director for uh, Davis Group, which includes WH Davis. Um, a little bit about WH Davis, uh, just so you know we are. We were formed in 1908, um, a wagon manufacturer, um, initially repairing uh, and producing small wooden bodied mineral wagons, um, primarily for the coal, coal traffic that was in the area where we were located. Um, we currently are uh, the last independent freight wagon manufacturer in the UK, and we're just located off the M1 at Junction 29, so pretty central in the country. Um, we also uh, design and manufacture bespoke containers and industrial trailers um, and WH Davis are part of the Davis group of companies which also consists of Davis Wagon Services and we're owned by a UK equity business called Paul Chester who are based in Winchester. Next slide please Ralph. So how we used to build wagons so this actual picture I dug this out of our archives this is what we used to call our Belfast shop in the early 1920s um, as you can see, they were small wooden bodied coal, um, coal wagons, um, primarily uh, wooden frames uh, made by carpenters uh, and skills along those sorts of lines. And um, we had our own sawmills, etc. at WH Davis at the time, which are now gone. Uh, but that just gives you a flavour of how it used to be done. 
No overhead cranes, Les. It was all just wheeled in, was it? Yeah, all wheeled in and basically manhandled about because the frames, etc., were light up until the point when they got their wheels and springs on. So yeah. and PPE looked like a flat cap. Wow. Uh yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 um this is a real brief overview, quick overview, guys, of um how we do this. So we will uh get a contract signed with our customer. We will then move on and produce um a set of design and manufacturer drawings. Uh, once they're completed, we'll also then put together a parts list. And what we do then is we will send our manufacturing drawings and our part list out to our suppliers. And that includes people for brakes, buffers, bogies, etc. cetera. Um, we also send our um, drawings to our steel agents and we will start to get the steel cut. Um, it's more cost effective for us to ask these big steel agency companies to do a lot of the profile cutting for us because they have laser cutters which cost several millions of pounds and and they justify it we we can't um the steel comes in um and what we'll start to do is we will start to make uh, our own sub assemblies and we will um obviously order our components off of the supply from the supply chain you can see a few pictures there uh, the top left is of a, an end headstock uh, sub assembly that we put together uh, the bottom left picture is of some side plates that were cut by our agent and are then delivered to us in that form. And then on the right hand side, the larger picture, you can see that those sub assemblies are starting to come together. And so this presumably is this one of your big nuclear vehicles. Uh, uh, no, that's that's an echo threat upside down. Upside, that's, that's upside down. So, OK, yeah. so, so the buffers would be in these four holes here. They yep. would be in there. Yeah. And the slot yeah. in the middle there is, is the draw is the draw gear slot. OK, so this headstock yeah. here is this piece here. It's part of that there. Yeah. yeah. OK, cool, mate. Thank you. Okay. So the next picture shows an overview of what we call our top shop. Um, this picture actually shows um, and I could have put hundreds of pictures in here, but I was limited in what I could put in. So this sort of gives a general flavor and overview of, of what we do in our largest manufacturing um, workshop at Davis. Um, so this was the production of 60 ton, uh, sorry, 60 cubic meter, 101.6 ton or 102 ton as everybody calls them boxes. So we have a production line system where we have a number of um, bays set out. And in those bays, we would have pre-arranged and pre-set welding jigs. Um, and then the, the, the panels, et cetera, you can see the side panels on the floor there. They come in ready formed and ready manufactured. They will then be placed into the jigs and then they will be tack welded into place to hold them um, safe and secure. And then they move on to the next bay. So basically the steel comes in at one end, it runs down the line to the end and then comes back up the other side. So are we going okay. this way, let's we start in here, going down there. Yeah, it goes back, down and then comes back up. Yeah. Um, so, so once the once the actual panels are all welded together and tack welded together, if you go to the next picture, Ralph, then basically what we do and we did with most wagons and with this these boxes is we stick them in one of our rotators. So basically, this is just a big wheel with fixings on the end, and we bolt it into the rotator. The reason we use the rotators is that it allows our guys to always be welding either horizontal or vertical. We don't do any overhead welding. Overhead welding is always more difficult to do and does tend to sometimes give more problems. So what happens here is we can actually turn the whole box around and make sure the guys are welding in a comfortable position. And so by welding in a comfortable position, that helps to ensure the quality and, and of the welds that we're producing on the on the boxes okay. i'm presumably uh, les is upside down that's the access hatch and this is the that's yeah that's entirely upside down so you're looking at the bottom of the wagon and the and the empty part of the wagon is on facing on the floor at the moment now yeah cool okay, okay thank you if you next next one next slide oh, um so basically um and yeah there's like i said i'm cutting lots of st steps out here because <laughs> i was limited on the number of slides we could put in but when the when the wagon's uh been welded it will then come off the rotators, be put into slave bogies. It then goes into uh, the shop blasting shop where the steel is shot blasted and prepped ready for painting. We then go through whatever the painting requirements are for the customer. Normally it's um, a water-based um, system. So we put a primer on and a water-based top coat. Um, the wagon is then comes out of the paint shop once it's dried and is put into what we call the bottom shop, which is where we do all the fit out. 
So that wagon there, you can see what we fit that in the in the in the bottom shop is we fit the bogies, the buffers, the draw gear, all the brake equipment, the pipe work, etc. Um, we will also fit all the necessary decals on there. You can see that one's just started to have the decals fitted. So the safety decals are being fitted, the wagon numbers fitted. And in that area also, we will carry out any testing that's required. Um, so we'll do the brake testing in that, in that facility there um, and ensure the brakes all okay. And then when we run the wagon out, um, and it's uh, a slide I forgot to put in, we actually run it out through a gauging uh, hole. So there is at the end of that line, there is basically a W6A gauge cut out into a frame. And so when we run it out, we can ensure that the wagon is within W6A gauge. So unless there's a lot of you know similarities with, with car manufacturer here where they do the body in white, they 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 basically yep. do the metal bashing, then they do the yep. painting and then they do the assembly. And that's yep. effectively what you're doing here, three stages. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like I say, the key the key things are obviously is for it all to come together on, in plan. So we're relying on our supply chain obviously to deliver the components on time. Mm -hmm. You know, we're producing the boxes to a plan and, and we tie our plan up so that everything arrives at the right time. And then basically, as the boxes are coming off the production line, they come into the bottom shop and the components are there ready to fit and put together. So yeah. you, you see, go to net. Yeah, sorry, sorry. that's just the no, three letter J and A there. Yeah. And then the e I MOS thing is the European thing. And then all this numbers, yeah. that's, that's the European thing. That's, that's, well. that's, that's the 12 digit number that we now apply in yeah. the UK. Okay. okay. If you go to the next slide. Oh. So, yeah, so then you see the finished products. So these were for our custom land recovery. And um, so basically there were 30 of these built and um, the customer is talking to us about some more. Um, but yeah, so that's that's the end product with regards to a box wagon. Um, another simple, quick thing that we wanted to add in was if you go to the next slide, Ralph. So one of the things we, we're quite proud of, of over the last six or so years is that we've been able to repurpose uh, old coal hoppers that were becoming redundant due to the, the demise of coal traffic. And the concept and idea originally came up for, uh, with a uh, WH Davis employee called Ian Welton, some of you probably knew Ian. Um, and he put this idea out into the industry in about 2015 time, I think it was, just as I was still at Two Axe. Um, and the idea was to cut and take out the middle sections of coal hoppers, uh, weld them back together, and then convert them into aggregate hoppers. The reason being is that coal uh, is quite light from a density perspective and aggregate is more dense. So by taking the section out of the middle, we could keep the 102 ton gross load, but um, you would not overfill. If you left it as a, a coal hopper, there was a probability and tendency to overfill coal hoppers with aggregate. So there you can see in the bottom picture, uh, uh, one of our in the bottom shop again that we were using where the wagons come in again on a production line, they start at the far end and we strip the wagons down of all the components. You can just see on the left hand side, we've cut the mid section out. They go across to the other side and attack welded in, in a frame so that they are all aligned correctly because that's a key point with doing this. And then they go back down the line and, and they actually do go onto a rotator, which you can't see there, but they do go on again onto a rotator where we are welding the actual seams together. Okay. I've got a photograph, Mitch. Uh, uh, sorry, as you, um, you, you referred, I think, earlier to the template that was cut out for the W6A. Is that the one that we see in the top left? Uh, uh, yes, that's just the top. That's, that's just it? a bit of it at the end there. Yeah. So that's half of Thanks. it. That's actually half of it, Phil. <laughs> I do have pictures of it, but like I say, I was limited yeah, to what yeah, I put in. So, um, so, so basically, yeah, we call them, uh, well, the, the rude name is a cut and shut. We like to call them repurposed wagons. Um, obviously, you know, from a, from a, from a, a carbon footprint perspective, it's good for the customer because actually we're reusing old wagons and putting them back into traffic. They're going to go back into traffic for, for a long a number of years, 10 plus years. Um, and basically it helps because we're not obviously using more raw material. There's not more raw steel being used. So it's always good for the carbon footprint. Okay. Um, next slide, yeah, Ralph. Just to say, uh, just yeah. these are my lovely HYAs that are coming to the end of their life being repurposed. Uh, and it's a yeah. great example of the freight industry re, re, reimagining itself and redeveloping itself. Yeah. Okay, so a little bit, I was asked to give a little bit about the construction market, I'll make this really quick. So at the moment, UK market is dominated by um, Greenbrier uh, Europe. 
Um, they are the largest wagon manufacturer in Europe, um, and a lot of builds do tend to come from there. Um, we are the only wagon manufacturer in the UK at the moment, um, and the rest that over the years have gone. There's some plates there that you will see for companies that some of you might have known or have seen in the past who were UK wagon manufacturers. Um, new builds for the UK are usually somewhere between 150 to 300 wagons per year. It's not a huge market. It's not like Europe where there are thousands. Um, the life of a wagon is usually around about 25 plus years. Um, so when we're ordering wagons and, and companies are ordering wagons, if especially leasing companies, they have to think about what is that wagon going to be doing for its entire life? A lot of leasing contracts are three to five years, maybe some 10 years, but what happens with a wagon after that? Is there a market for it? Um, we do in the UK have a, a lot of non-standard designs, whereas in Europe, you go to a lot of wagon manufacturers and you'll see similar, similar, very similar wagons being built, especially into modal wagons, hopper wagons, and they'll all have the same types of codes like phones, et cetera, and the NOS boxes. Um, but we tend to we tend to have a lot of uh, non-standard designs that wouldn't work in Europe. Um, as a manufacturer, our infrastructure in the UK uh, gives us a problem trying to sell into Europe because we can't build wagons to European gauges to then transport down the UK network to go through the tunnel. We have to transport it by road, whereas European manufacturers are lucky enough to build to a smaller gauge and they can run them straight through the tunnel and into the UK. So that's that's not a benefit to us as a UK manufacturer. Uh, our main competition is from Eastern Europe. Um, and obviously there are resultant and, and differences in labor costs um, and currency fluctuations that affect pricing when we quote within for the UK builds in the UK market. Um, Everybody knows about the UK skills crisis in the UK at the moment, including manufacturing, and that, and it does include the rail sector and ourselves. Um, it's something that we're looking to address, but I don't think anybody's got any quick answers to that at the moment. Um, we The test and approval costs in the UK can sometimes be high, um, and a lack of test facilities sometimes doesn't help us. We do tend to only have one test track, which is um, at Melton. And that's always full up with passenger stock and is extremely expensive to hire. Um, so that can add lots of cost into it. And, and, and another point that we, we pick up on is that um, there's a reliance on, on in the UK for UK wagons on one bogey manufacturer. If you want a TF25, there's only one manufacturer for that. If you're looking for a specific type of intermodal bogey, then there's only one manufacturer. It's only when you get to Y type bogies that you can go to Europe. But there is a tendency in the UK not to use Y type bogies uh, so much now. Okay, let's we just got to crack on a little bit with the last slide. Yeah, one last one. So uh, the future for wagon manufacturing in the UK, to be honest, you need a crystal ball to see that. There's always loads of noise. Uh, by that, I mean there's always loads of inquiries. I get phone calls every week from multiple people asking for wagon prices, delivery times, but the amount that actually materializes into any real work is is very small. Um, the bottom line always wins in our market, guys. It's it's basically cost wins because cost is what our, our network is driven on. We are all commercialized businesses in rail freight in the UK, and that's where that's where it, it lies. Uh, what's it going to look like in the future? Well, the UK market is pretty fixed. We we have the 25.4 ton axle load, so everybody always wants usually wants boxes and hoppers. On that axle load, an intermodal is 20.5 20, 20 tonne. People are moving to the shorter 40 foot type wagons of Echo Fret and short liners. Um, and I see that going on for the future. I do think the market will continue to be dominated by Greenbrier, mainly because of their size and their ability to produce large numbers. And Wabtech will, will dominate the, the bogey market for, for UK bogies. Um, I'm probably not going to help Ralph in his presentation here, but um, innovation in the freight industry is stifled because of cost. There's, there's no question about that. It's all out there. You can have it all, electric brakes, WSP, DAX, you can have it, but it all costs and the market can't take it. The market, it can't take the cost in the builds of new wagons. And I'm sure my European um, associates would agree with me, wagon builders that are on the call. Um, and for the reasons I've said above, I'd be surprised if anyone actually came into the market as a new wagon manufacturer in the UK, 
they'd really be pushing an elephant up the hill, guys. So, um, so I think that's me done, Ralph, isn't it? Thank you very much, Les. Just a couple okay. of quick slides from me about what might happen in the future. I want to talk about intelligent wagons. So we're doing some research for network rail. This is off the back of uh, some work we did for the RSSB on digital autocouplers. So an intelligent wagon means a wagon that's self-monitoring. And for that, it needs power. And it's able to report in real time. And to do that, it needs a data connectivity. So the European solution to this is what's called a digital autocoupler. So this is uh, this is the digital autocoupler. It looks very, very similar to a passenger coupler. It has a Scharfenberg head, which enables the wagons to gather together when they're brought together. On the top of it, there's a hood which will rotate, and there's a socket in there which will enable elect electricity and data to go down the consist. Um, through doing that, you, you've uh, you've already got a proof of what's called train integrity. You know that the wagon hasn't separated at any stage. On each wagon, there's, there's essentially a, a couple of plugs. There's a there's a data node which allows you to plug in equipment, and there's a power plug, perhaps with a secondary power a battery to give you some power when the locomotive is disconnected. This core infrastructure allows you to plug and play various pieces of equipment to to give you um, monitoring on the wagons. And the, the, the research we did for the RSSB, this is the T1264. This gives you a list of, that's a research project, this gives you a list of some of the stuff that can be done. Uh, you can put GPS on, uh, you can do partial brake, brake tests. Very importantly, you can do derailment detection. Um, the great thing about this is that you get real-time reporting back to the driver. So the driver can see if there's any problems uh, uh, coming out. And also you can give uh, real-time information to the, the wagon maintainer, or you can allow data to be downloaded at the end of the journey. So actually you're going to get better information on wagon mileage. You're able to do a condition survey of, of the vehicles and stuff like that. You can do load monitoring as well. That's a big issue. Uh, so there's, there's a huge pile of stuff that can be done. I think the, the, the major benefit is it might help us avoid this. So this is the Langelec development three or four years ago. It looks like something that I mean, I, whenever I see this image, it, it shocks me. It looks like something out of the Ukraine, to be perfectly honest. It, it, it's really, really terrible, twisted metal all over the place. The root cause of this is that one of these axles got locked uh, and was dragged for, for like 16 kilometers. Um, uh, and the driver was completely unaware. Uh, the, the got a flat spot, it derailed, the wagon set on fire. Um, they were carrying uh, petroleum. It uh, damaged the triple SI. Um, it couldn't have been much, well, it could have been much worse. It could have been in the middle of a major city. But, you know, actually, the driver didn't know. And one of the big uh, big challenges I think that rail freight had is, is to stop this sort of thing happening. You know, actually, you know, there were serious questions about whether rail should continue to, to move dangerous goods off the back of this. Um, and I think it's only because the alternative was worse that, that they decided not to do it. Um, and so this is a solution to this, that, that it would stop this kind of thing happening. So this is why Network Rail is supporting further research into this. So that's intelligent wagons. Uh, and then the next thing is energy recovery. So this is a, a rig that's on test at the moment. Um, basically, uh, there's, a, there's a motor at the back here, which is, which is, um, which is pretending to be the wagon. Uh, and then there's a clutch and gear drives to a pump which enables you on braking to move hydraulic fuel, hydraulic uh, fluid from a low pressure environment to a high pressure environment. Um, and then when you want power, you can reverse it and you can take fuel, uh, you can take energy from the high pressure uh, environment to the low pressure environment and, and put tractive effort back into the wagon. So the advantages are twofold. Um, first of all, uh, you get better starting tractive effort. You can use the power to, to lift. Um, it's free, free energy. Um, and also um, you're applying power all the way down the consist. And, and so uh, Les mentioned in passing wheel slip, it's a big, big issue here where all the power to move a train is, is just under 12 small spots underneath the locomotive wheels. And actually therefore they spin on bad rail conditions. And this allows you to put power down the wagon. But as Les said, innovation is really, really difficult. Uh, and part of the issue with this is that, that actually it's expensive. Uh, the benefits are distributed across the supply chain and, and, and actually whether anybody will actually do this, I don't know because it's very expensive. But certainly this is the sort of thing that ought to happen. You know, actually in these days of, um, of, of power crises and stuff like this, free energy has not got to be turned up. Anyway, so there's some stuff there, uh, but Les is absolutely right. Um, 
Phil, how do you want to do the question and answers? Do you want me to take right? Um, we've probably got about five minutes maximum, a bit, bit less. Um, I'll try and run through a few of these. So we've got one from Connor, operating speed. Could you explain a bit more about how wagon type stroke design affects this, please? So, for example, why is class seven trains have to be class seven? Are there other factors besides the wagons that dictate train class and maximum speed? Who wants to take that? Well, uh, Phil, I'll, I'll take that one. We are going to do another one on timetabling, but it's basically the, the, it's to do with speed uh, and, and all the different classes. Class 4 is 70, 75 mile an hour, class 6 is 60 miles an hour. Uh, and that's linked, as Mitch has said earlier, to the, the axle weight. So there's a few people with some uh, some comments about uh, in their own sort of not uh, sharing their own knowledge. Um, but I'll take one from Tom, which is how does the UK freight interact with the European freight for onward travel between nations when we, when we have a delta between wagon gauge profile, etc. I think you probably covered some of the problems about interaction with European gauges, but if there's any anything further on that. Do you want to say anything, Les? Is there anything else? No, to uh, and I can just, all I can say is obviously wagons, we build to, um, when wagons are coming through the tunnel, then they have to meet the UK gauge. So um, whichever type of vehicle they are, they will be built, whether in Europe or the UK, to, to meet that gauge. What we won't get is we won't get European wagons on G gauges coming through the tunnel, apart from up to Barking on HS1, but that's the, that's the end of their limit. So when we were going around the uh, the Davis factory, um, Michael was suggesting it's a good candidate for BBC's Inside the Factory programme. I think it's very similar to the one that uh, Greg Morris has already done uh, at Alston building passenger vehicles. Um, so they might want to repeat. Or when I say passenger, I mean self-loading freight, of course. Mm -hmm. um, ooh, there's a question from, um, from Malcolm. How much extra in pounds and as a percentage would intelligent wagons with autocoupler cost? Oh, hi, yeah, Malcolm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Malcolm, that's good, good to hear from you. Um, uh, yes, we, we did do this as part of the uh, RSSB project. Uh, I think we were talking about, um, with it all worked out, the core infrastructure, uh, that's without any um, of the monitoring, would be about uh, 20 to 25,000 pounds per wagon if there was a fleet build. So, you know, 20, 20 percent, something like that. Um, uh, but that would require a, a, a fleet build, and, and that was a retrofit. So yeah. um, it's, it's quite a lot of money. Um, the, the the energy recovery system doesn't depend on intelligent wagons. Um, it's a, it's at the moment when we're proceeding on the on, on the basis of some kind of um, well different way of monitoring it. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, so Maggie just flashed up there. Right. OK, so I think um, we're probably going to have to draw this to a close because it's two minutes to go. Um, real apologies for those of you who are putting questions and comments that we haven't been able to uh, to cover. But please tune in to future uh, webinars where some of these um, opportunities might might get uh, presented again. So. Um, for me then, uh, can I thank Ralph, Mitch and, uh, and Les? Um, I've got a lot out of this morning, I'm sure, judging by the comments and questions other people have, uh, have too. Um, don't forget that our second technical webinar in this series is on Thursday, the 2nd of March, again uh, at 8.30. And, we'll be, and um, so we'll be going through how a locomotive works and how this affects payload. On Tuesday the 7th of March, Ralph takes a break while we host a webinar in association with Binary Carbon during Decarbonisation Transport Week, when we're going to be looking at the challenges uh, presented by the circular economy. Then we come back to this sequence uh, of events on the 18th of April. We're back with Ralph again for further insight, this time on rail loading and track access charging. And then finally, we conclude the series on the 18th of May when Ralph and his team will be leading us through the intricacies and mysteries of railway signalling. Full details of these and other events can be found on the Rail Fruit Freight Group website, which is www.rfg.org.uk. Um, also like to mention when you, when you go in on, on the website, you'll see details of our upcoming Scottish conference on the 29th of March. We'll be glad to see as many of you there as possible. 
and also uh, to announce that today we're going to be putting up details of our awards event that we run in September. And although that's uh, a fair way off, uh, if you've got something in the, uh, that you're doing in the industry, you think uh, you'd like to showcase by means of uh, presenting it for award, details of how to do that will be shared with you uh, on our website and please get your uh, entries in. Great, so thanks for joining us and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you.